Hello there, and welcome to the podcast. This is your host, Esther, speaking. Today, we are going to talk with three established artists in the games industry. We'll discuss their journey, their experiences, and advice they have for artists who are either interested or want to break into the field. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Jeremy Fenske. I've been working in games for my 12th year now. Uh, in games. I started with Bethesda working on Elder Scrolls Online. I uh, worked at High Moon with the one Esther Wu here for a little bit. Uh, so we, we know each other at that level. Um, and now I'm working as a, an art director, concept artist at a new startup studio here in Santa Monica. And we're growing fast and things are crazy and we're in crazy times. And it's yeah, it's super awesome to be here and get, get a chance to talk to you guys. It's a shame that we have to make a podcast to have a conversation, <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> but thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, Christina Ness. Most people call me Ness. I'm a, currently a senior concept artist at System Era Softworks up here in Seattle, but uh, I have bounced all over the West Coast. I've done indie, AAA, contract, full-time, to freelance. Um, I also own an LLC that I route my evening Moonlight freelance through. So, yeah, I think it's my actual, like, eight year, eighth year in the industry. Going to go on nine. So, pretty wild. Um, Tim Kaminsky. Uh, let's see. I started out, like eight or nine years ago, I think around the same time as Ness. And I've been working at mobile studios and then doing freelance and contract work. Uh, I worked on like uh, Clash Royale and Brawl Stars and a number of projects. And now I'm at Wonderstorm where I'm working as an art director on Dragon Prince and working on a game. We have a show. We just won an Emmy. That's really cool. It's very unexpected. Thank you. Uh, So yeah, that's where I'm at. Nice. Yeah, so what's interesting about everyone here is that everyone has a lot of experience. Do you want to kind of go over quickly, uh, you know, like starting from school and then working? Um, Because like everyone here didn't just like land on like one job and work there for like five years. You know, what was that like, you know, as an experience where you did gradually go from junior, mid, senior, then, you know, eventually art director and with varied studio experiences? Jeremy, do you want to take it away? Yeah. my trajectory is a little different. I didn't go to SCAD for one, like these these three <laughs> over here. Uh, I went to a school called Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I know that's impressive, but um, <laughs> no one's heard of it. Um, but I actually joined uh, uh, the fine arts uh, department. I, I always knew I wanted to do concept art, even when I was in high school, because I would go on like the forums, like conceptart.org and and Ipu and all that folder online stuff so I, I always knew I wanted to get into game concept art but I knew I didn't want to go the route of like il- learning illustration editorial illustration I knew I just wanted to get really good at drawing really good at painting and those fundamentals would probably help me with um with what I wanted to do in the entertainment industry um and that's what I did I was just a, f- a fine artist so I didn't quite fit in with the fine art kids and I didn't quite fit in with the illustration kids right so I was kind of in this like weird middle group and I, I just focused on like drawing, did a lot of figure drawing, a lot of landscape painting, a lot of oil painting. Um, and that's kind of what my roots are and it's just in traditional painting. And on the side, I worked on my digital work, worked on my portfolio really hard my senior year in college. And then I just applied like everywhere. I applied to like over 60 places. I just didn't care what it was. I just wanted a call back <laughs> from somebody. Right. Um, yeah. And I was pretty fortunate to get a call back from Bethesda and and I started interviewing with them and I was like Elder Scrolls what the hell is Elder Scrolls I didn't even know what it was when I started <laughs> and then I and then I quickly found out and I was like oh wow maybe this is actually a really good job I didn't even realize how good it was. <laughs> um, yeah, but I was very junior and and it was it was tough and I, I would say that the, my first two years I probably learned way more about concept art and, and games than my whole life at that point, right? Those first two years working in a studio, I learned so much, right? And yeah, and it was, it's, I could keep going. It was a long trajectory after that, but it was such a, you know, just starting in the games industry. I just learned a ton uh, yeah. the first I, couple of years. Yeah, and that's interesting too. And that's who I, I've, you know, gone to school with. Uh, what Jeremy talking about fine arts, I know for you, for a fact, you did a lot of sequential arts. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. definitely I'm started. I'm like the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Tim, I feel Tim is closer to uh, like 
we wanted to do concept art. I mean, we were in the illustration. <laughs> yeah, but... it was it was what was intended, but it wasn't really what was there either, though. So yeah. I talked about that when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> So with Ness, it's like, how did you also like, you know, starting from there, your skill set from, you know, sequential arts and comic and inking. How did that kind of start it all off too? Yeah. So I went to SCAD and I studied um, sequential art, which is basically comic books and storyboards. And I took one concept art for games course with a great professor. And I was like, (laughs) so, (laughs) but I actually think that like my background, you know, growing up reading comics, drawing comics, studying comics is 100% applicable to game art. I wouldn't be where I am today without it because my focus is mostly on storytelling and like hardcore visual storytelling and how do you convey story elements to a player with no text, no dialogue, maybe not even being able to interact with an environment, right? How do you convey something towards them, right? So I think unlike most of you lovely, beautiful artists in this chat, um, I'm more line-based and not very painterly and I don't spend a lot of time rendering. (laughs) <laughs> but th- that all comes from a comics background. I do have a similar experience to Jeremy where it's like, you know, starts to get your junior and senior year in college and you're just like applying, applying, applying. I had a folder of all the apps I sent out and it was like, I sent out 200 applications just to work anywhere doing like whatever, right, in games. And then I ended up doing a bit of freelance, you know, just like a one-off two-month contract for some like top-down isometric RTS game. And I was like, I really like this. And I was like doing that in my evenings, even after schoolwork. And then my senior year, I got uh, doing contract work with Riot Games with the Champion Update team. And then that just kind of spun, kind of, you know, you build up contract after contract, you gain more experience. Jeremy put it totally correctly when he said that, you know, you kind of learn more in the first two years of your first studio job than any kind of schooling you could do or any type of like self-taught study you could do, like, Yeah, for me, hands-on experience really kind of like gave me that next level up I needed, just like the title of this podcast. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) and then Tim, you had a very similar trajectory too with uh, contract work, right, and after school. Yeah, uh, kind of my getting into school was a little bit different, I think. I sort of started out just being like, oh, I'm going to do drawing, whatever that is. And I thought I was going to do manual labor the rest of my life. I didn't realize there was a place you could work and make money doing using art and stuff like that. So I started doing like community college was my first sort of pass into education. And I really focused on illustration and drawing. Uh, but around that same time, I was also playing around a lot with uh, like original unreal tournament the editor and i was like building my house and stuff in 3d so there was a point where i could have like shot off to be like a 3d artist at that point but i dropped all digital stuff went completely traditional for like a number of years and only did like drawing and everything and then from there i got to like a four-year college got my degree in illustration and i was still like i want to be a concept artist but i didn't really know what that meant there was like concept.org which i saw and i was like i'd post something once in a while and then people would give me really good feedback and i'd be like oh i'm crushed so uh and i just kept pushing on that and i got out of there got my degree and ended up getting a job doing like graphic design for four years and i hated it but i stick stuck it out for four years and purposely got myself fired and then wow uh intentionally so that I could go to SCAD so that I started preparing my portfolio to SCAD and started applying but every time I applied I was they were like it's going to cost this much and I was like that's too much and they would be like well if you give me another portfolio maybe we can lower it down so I kept applying with new portfolios and they kept giving me more financial aid until the point where I was like well I can kind of afford that I guess and I'm still paying that back um (laughs) Uh, but uh, right out of uh, SCAD, I did get a job using, I made like two portfolios while I was in SCAD. I did one that was a pure like concept art one, and then one that was like a visual development path. And I ended up using both of those to kind of get my job, uh, which they were looking for a character artist, but then they saw my environments. They're like, oh, let's hire you for environments. That's kind of like the first tiptoe into the industry there. Cool. Yeah, nice. Would you all say that breaking in was the hardest? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I would never want to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it seems that, you know, that first grind, that first, like, you know, foot in the door seems to be everyone's struggle 
I, was saying, I think I really just lucked out. I just think like, <laughs> I think like they just put like a bunch of the applicants names in a hat and just randomly picked mine. I guess I worked really hard up front and it wasn't like, oh shit, I'm graduated. Now I need to find a job. And then I worked really hard. Like I had been working very hard for like the year before that making a portfolio. So when it came time to like get the job, it was easy it was hard because i had to like submit to a lot of places but it just it kind of happened i was like wait really me what i couldn't believe that it was actually happening <laughs> i feel like a lot of getting your foot in the door just getting like you know a studio to take a chance on you there is an element of luck but i feel like that luck equation is right portfolio right time and sometimes it you have the right portfolio and it just doesn't match up with like what a studio needs and other times you luck out and it is like you know, there's definitely a bit of luck to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for for me, there was there was luck, but I think also like, I kind of what Jeremy said. Like, I put a lot of work up front so that I didn't have to put as much work looking for the job. So, like my first job, I got that one at like a career fair, and I had like physical portfolios and I saw them in person, and everything. But I actually didn't apply to any other jobs after that. Like all the jobs I've gotten have been me being lazy and just putting tons of work out there. And then letting people come to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're fishing. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So yeah, that kind of leads on to the next topic, next question, where um, unlike animation, games doesn't have a union, and there's like really only a set amount of companies. AAA alone, there are ten studios probably I could just name that's only in California. You know, so it's very limited, and so the competition is super slim for concept artists, right? Would you say that upon, you know, when breaking in, was there a difference in like a small studio versus a big one? I've mostly been like mostly indie studios, but then I've worked at like uh, Axis Animation stuff doing freelance and contract work. So a lot of the larger studios that I've worked at have been freelance and contract work. The huge difference for me has always been kind of the breadth of uh, expectations of what you're going to be working on. In smaller studios, I actually credit a lot of my kind of expertise in different fields to that because I would start by doing concept art and then I'd be like modeling and I'd be like implementing something in the engine. And now I've done like rigging, animation, modeling, sculpting, 2D concept art, 3D concept art, and like texturing and like modeling for stuff in games as well as just like for concept art. So it's, I've had that broad spectrum of, of, uh, challenges just because I was at a smaller studio and I had to kind of tackle every different area in art. And part of that too is just, I wanted to know more about it so that I just like learning stuff. I guess it's really not a big reason behind that other than I want to teach and uh, art direction, I guess, lined it up pretty well with that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm kind of, kind of similar. Like for me, as far as like big studio and small studio, it's, it's, kind of the opposite of what you'd expect every new studio I go to tends to get smaller <laughs> so when I started so I started with ZeniMax and Bethesda we were working on the game there was only 30 of us it was had the small team environment but our studio for that game blew up to 450 uh, in, a, in, a, in just a couple years so uh, it became a huge studio uh, huge operation um, and then when I left there with the high moon I mean it was like working with Activision so you are a very 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 tiny cog in a very very big very big machine you know, working on Bungie's game, uh, Destiny. And then moving into the position I'm in now is is very small. Like, um, I kind of helped uh, build a team in the studio here at Singularity 6. We When we started, it was just three of us in a spare bedroom. And for me, going from big studios where we had like a massage therapist on staff, <laughs> and, we had, <laughs> and then the studio before, we had like a cafeteria and all these great benefits to like, being in a spare bedroom building a desk and like yeah we're gonna make this studio it's gonna be fun like going from that to that was just like it was so much fun for me because i'm i'm not used to that right so it's always like the the, the grass is greener on the other side right if you've been in small studios and wish to be in a big studio it may not be what you think it is because <laughs> when you're in a bigger I studio you you are just like you are doing your the assembly line comes by. It's like, this is the task that has to be done. You do it. And then you do the next task that comes by. And then you're like, Hey, but what about the process? Can I No, shut up, go back to your desk, keep working. Um, being at a smaller studio, you do have a lot more say, uh, you are able to you know, be intrinsic to the process. Like what Tim is talking about, he's doing like character and rigging. Like, so am I, like I'm, doing so much more in the engine now learning, doing a lot more 3d work and more than, 
concept work, honestly, in my position. For me, I just love the new experience and having like another experience to just put under my belt, just feel like, yeah, this was something that I, I threw myself out in the deep end. I learned how to swim and now I'm better. I'm a better artist. I'm a better game developer, you know, coming out of that. Mm -hmm. I've almost like bounced between Indian AAA for years. Like I have worked at Riot and Valve and then also smaller studios like Runic Games and now System Era. And even just done like pickup work for local indies around here in Seattle. And I think the biggest difference too is the amount of other concept artists you work with, right? Like at, at Riot, just on the champion update team, on the team I was on, there was like five or six of us concept artists. they all be kind of like contributing to updating one character at a time versus like right now at System Era, I'm the only concept artist and I'm feeding not only um, 3D modelers for the game, but also feedback for outsourcers and concept for like some other like outside of, you know, extracurricular like cross media stuff we're doing. And so it is really interesting to be like, oh, you know, when I'm actually looking through my portfolio, I produce a lot more when I'm indie and have to wear all these different hats than when I'm, you know, in a AAA environment. So that also brings up another question um, at the segue it into like kind of times changing. Uh, like when I was breaking in around, we're all around the same time. It was very much focused on like you were doing, you were doing one thing good, you know, like you were the environment concept artist and you painted like, you know, giant map paintings or whatever, or you were the character designer and you did armor and whatnot. But everyone here has actually, I would say a more generalist, you know, like Ness, you can paint environments uh, if you know, need be, and Tim yeah. and Jeremy, <laughs> who I know are environment artists, uh, concept artists, will, can paint a character. <laughs> and so would you say that, like, generalist skills more prized after versus specialized talents? Like, because there's definitely a difference between character design and environment design. They're different design theories. Um, yeah, I, I actually think they're way more similar than different. Uh, you know, one is you have to create the illusion of space, and one is more about shape design and storytelling. And the drawing fundamental and the design fundamental is the same, no matter if you're doing environment, prop, or character work. Like, it's all very much the same. So if you have great drawing fundamental, if you have great drawing skills, you can handle both pretty easily, right? Um, one may just require you to understand a bit more about, like, anatomy, a little bit more about portion and form and form <laughs> language and the other maybe you have to learn a little bit more about perspective and camera angle and shot and composition right but the fundamentals to me are actually very similar um, and I handle them the same way with the same mindset I don't know if yeah, you, I agree. you guys agree or disagree I agree with that as well I think for me it's it's a lot about the fundamentals but it's more of like a confidence level of like confidence on environments versus characters like i've drawn this many environments this many characters so obviously <laughs> i'm gonna be a little more confident in one than the other uh but yeah like jeremy said i think it's all about fundamentals and for me it's the the kind of mindset when i'm approaching that if i'm confident about what i'm doing if i practice then i'm probably gonna be fine part, part of the issue i see a lot is you get students who come out of school with a portfolio that's like all characters and i see that all the time and odds are if you get into a studio setting whether or not it's like triple a or indie you're not going to be doing characters especially as like a junior artist right so um you know maybe the warrior painters fan base is a little different because you guys do a lot of environment plain air stuff but um in in general like when it comes to junior and like entry level games artists and applicants it's almost only characters and i don't see any props or any environments and that always breaks my heart because like you know if you just think of like what goes into a game there's one main character that's like very expensive to like rig and test and get everything going for that one character and then there's hundreds of trees hundreds of rocks lots of crates drawbridges cars jeeps like whatever and it's like all of that stuff actually needs to be designed as well and needs to create a cohesive environment so if you diversify your skill set and if you are like you know i kind of jokingly refer to myself and like my bios as like a swiss army knife concept artist like you just kind of have to be able to design anything right like especially on indie teams if you are the only concept artist or you're kind of a set of two like sure maybe one of you tends towards like creature design and one tends towards hard surface but like 
if you're in production mode and you're the bottleneck, you just need to be able to like design something for the 3D artist just to get the game out the door. It's all about shipping something. And you know, if you have two character specialists, like who's gonna make the crates? <laughs> <laughs> I hate crates. Easily like 90% of everything that gets made into a game and designed is environment based. <laughs> Yeah, at, at least so yeah. yes yes as you guys are progressing through your you know jobs and your careers like did those fundamentals and that generalist skill set help you as you progress versus like being even more zoned in and specialized like and Dermot and Tim both are talking about like taking on way more responsibilities and learning about you know more than just your concepts on paper um and Ness you two as a senior concept artist um supplying a lot of art support you know would you say that with time changing and as you move along your career that being more knowledgeable I guess is kind of the way to go like yes I, I see everyone nodding yeah, uh, <laughs> for sure I think I I wouldn't have the job I have if I didn't have the information and knowledge I have literally my boss said to me when through the hiring process he's like I really want your brain on this project and I was like oh no one said that to me before. That's great. That's and, really good. That yeah, that was great. that was actually I'm one flattered. of like the big things where I'm like, oh, I really want to be at the studio because no one's always, always everyone's always been like, oh, I want like what you can draw, like mm -hmm. your output. But this was it was about my brain more so. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, this is great. Like as a yeah as art director now, my perspective on this whole thing has shifted. You know, before like as a concept artist for me is like get good, bro. Like. Get good at environment painting, go get at paint, you know, get at like, get good at perspective, learn 3D, do all this stuff, like just get good at craft. And and that's super important. Like just being a concept artist is like this never ending lifelong skill that you'll keep grinding at. But I being an art director position, I have to direct tech artists, animation, right? Um, character, you know, like all these different departments that I had no experience behind. And I have to like go at them and be like, guys, I come from a concept art background. You need to teach me. So I, in the last two years of, of doing this job, I have learned so much. I, I, you know, I've learned how to like use the engine and use materials and, and world build and do all these things. So I think for me, it's been a huge learning uh, experience for me. And I, I've been able to like spread out beyond just painting and drawing good and learning how to uh, lead an art team, right? And that and that is like a whole new skill set that I had to start from ground zero on and, and learn. And I think it's really important. Like I am grasping at every bit of knowledge that I have from previous studios on like what we did in terms of like customization systems, in terms of like modularity, just to like make good decisions about what I'm doing now. And I'm so thankful that I was open to those and I was working with uh, other teams like back when I was at Bethesda and, and learning from those guys in our process then because I'm using every morsel of knowledge from that time to help guide this new team uh, in, on this new project. I think that actually is a really interesting topic as well that we could do a whole different podcast about, but like the difference between like high functioning individual contributors right like really really uh competent concept artists it's a totally different skill set than like actually being a manager and actually being in charge of people and i have had manager level leads who are absolutely incredible and fantastic about like managing people and also super skilled in their own right and then sometimes you've worked under people who are super incredible like artists and have zero like soft skills or zero clue how to like manage people and that can always be a bummer. But yeah, like to get academic about it, you know, you want to be T shaped in your skill set, right? You want to have one or two like areas of expertise that you have deep knowledge on. And then you also want to have like a general knowledge about lots of other other topics, such as like animation or rigging or 3D or narrative design, you know, whatever. And that broadens your kind of understanding of the full pipeline out. Like I think Games are so, so unique because there's so many different moving parts. You know, like I've worked in comics, done a little, little bit of animation work. And games are the only medium where it's like, it's a miracle if any game gets finished. And there are just so many people that need to touch it to get it out the door. And so many different areas of expertise that need to be involved in it it's like a giant moving puzzle and you know i commend the art directors <laughs> on this call so. yeah when you, when you start the project it's like this at the very beginning it's like this nicely crafted boat 
And then as the boat gets bigger and bigger, cracks start to appear. And then you find, you get some duct tape and you duct tape it real quick. And then another crack appears on the other side of the boat. And when you duct tape that one, it causes another one. And then you just do this over and over and over and again. And until, more. Yeah. <laughs> until the game is gold. And then you just worry about patching everything up. And then you get this I, kind I, of like makeshift. <laughs> You get this makeshifty duct tape boat at the end, and it kind of works. Well, uh, that's game development. Like, it's gonna, it's gonna ship with bugs. Like you're never gonna hit zero yeah. bugs. Yeah, it's true. So, yeah. Yeah. it's shippable. shippable. It's, it's an organic say. living creature thing. <laughs> For me, something that I hadn't thought about kind of before getting into art direction was like the people component side of things. I'd always thought of it more about like yeah. it's just like oh, we're gonna create a ton of art. I'm gonna show them what art to make and everything, but. For me, a huge, huge component is just like literally interacting with people and being empathetic and being like, oh, how, what's this person going through? Like, especially right now during the pandemic, like it's, we have, you know, people that have moved across the country and then suddenly they're trapped in their house alone. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, uh, art is only a, a component of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so in the end, fundamentals, that's critical to your art mm -hmm. development. Yeah, and if, yeah. you know, especially if you want to do, uh, stay in the trajectory of games that will carry you forward right until whatever late stage you are in. That's interesting too, as Jeremy and, and Tim has just you know, and Ness have brought up about uh, basically soft skills outside of craft. Um, I just wanted to kind of take that opportunity to highlight, you know, basically the soft skills too, yeah. right? Communication. It's how important is that? Do you think, like, it, outside of just presenting your portfolio, but also just being a nice person, <laughs> like, you know, uh, simplifying it as that, you know, like what were you also your experiences and kind of like takeaways from being approachable, amicable, or working on like communication skills. That's or the only reason I ever got work. <laughs> like, <laughs> at least especially at the start is just being like super friendly and enthusiastic and like genuinely wanting to like understand how games are made. Like, I, I I cannot stress soft skills enough. Um, and like in in school, I feel we were always told like, okay, pick two. You can be super good at what you do. You can hit all of your deadlines, or you can be amazing to work with, right? So if you're like an okay artist, but you're like really great at deadlines and really good to work with, you know, you can find work somewhere. There's been a lot of um, jobs I've had where I've gotten to the interview stage, and I'm like, okay, I can like charm them now, right? Because <laughs> It, it it does come down to soft skills and in the end like I'd rather work with another artist who's like just a good person and like just fun to be around and genuinely takes good critique and gives good critique and is maybe a average artist than like a rock star who just yeah. is a total asshole and super yeah. toxic to the team culture like you know I'm sure uh Jeremy and Tim can talk a little more about like building like a non-toxic work environment by picking very specific people on the team to, to kind of organically create that? For me, soft skills are a huge, huge, huge component about the interview. I, like By the time I'm talking to someone on an interview call, I already know what their work looks like. I already know like generally how they work usually, if they have some process videos somewhere. So I already know a lot about their art, but I don't know much about them. So for me, interview process is almost all about that. It's like, how how is this person gonna interact with the team? We have like five people here. What is adding one more person to that group? What does that do? How does that affect everyone else's soft skills? So there's, yeah, a lot of thought goes into that. Yeah, like uh, if you come on site for an interview or if you do a test and they like it, that means as far as like craft, as far as art, you're done. You're good. You've passed the test. You're, you're yes. The next stage that's really important to a lot of studios is in the on site. They don't care as much about your craft they care more about your communication and collaboration skills and all the questions are usually more geared towards that um, you're not going to come on site and then they're like they sit you down with some a pencil and paper and say okay draw me this concept real fast you know like there's no <laughs> test like that if you're but if you are an engineer if you're a programmer you do have to do that and there are tests like that yeah, there whiteboard. Are tests like that. <laughs> whiteboard programming which oh. is new to me and i was like 
oh my god that's oh, so terrible <laughs> <laughs> but as as artists you don't have to do that our portfolio should do all the talking in terms of like our art craft and you know when when we hire people we care a lot about that we huge we, we weigh very heavily on this like we ask them questions about like hey if you ever work with somebody who's difficult how do you resolve conflict how do you uh, delegate like these are things that are really important that really important skills that you need to learn because it could make or break your interview if you come off as like oh i don't like taking feedback or this person this art director one time didn't like what i did and i thought they were stupid and I, you know it's like you have to be empathetic you have to be a good collaborator and know that like this project is not about you like concept art is amazing and it's great and we love it but in terms of the grand scheme of a game production it's very small actually i mean it, it and- is i don't want to say it's tiny but it's 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 not all about you (laughs) and in terms in terms of game production no concept art makes it into the final game like nothing we do is actually in game all we do is like help influence other artists and like we're just like the foundation like supporters of everything that actually goes in game right like Like, hey we yeah. can't animate this transparent fabric in your concept because it's going to ruin our, our frame rate, basically. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and you have to be as a concept artist okay with that and be like, oh, okay, I understand because there's optimization and other things considered. We can't do that. And then you have like, to come up with a visual solution for that. And then you have to come up with a visual solution. <laughs> the art directors. Or, are. If you, or if you're me, it's just not going to animate and it's not going to be transparent. <laughs> you with it. You're just going to cut it. Yeah, that gets cut. That's, yeah. Cut it. Um, yeah, part of the interview process, you know, as you're trying to balance a, you know, a competent portfolio, you're also trying to like show yourself as a competent person. Video games as a whole has a lot of, well, for anyone who kind of is interested in the field, but still a lot of dinosaurs in games. So people like Fensky, Ines, and Tim are ones who are, you know, like out changing. <laughs> We're know, more like things. raptors, not, yeah. not dino, you know, not, <laughs> just, yeah. uh, not T-Rex, just raptors. <laughs> just raptors. Um, Gotta stay but, agile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As we're talking about interviewing process, time to focus, you know, on the portfolio. So what's like you guys' portfolio advices? We're talking about breaking in, not the, I'm trying to apply to the senior artist role. I think for me, something that I don't see a lot in portfolios and I want to see more of, and people are sometimes unwilling to show it, is process work. Sometimes the final piece doesn't really mean that much to me without seeing the process because I'm not seeing your decision making. I don't know how you came to this piece necessarily. And that is more important a lot of times than the final piece. Uh, That tells me how you work. It shows how consistent you work. It shows like, is this a repeatable process? Because in the end, a lot of times art is about process and it's not about just like sitting down to paint something. It's about building up your own personal process that works uh, to be able to achieve concept art. And a lot of times I see portfolios where it's just like, you know, 10, 15 immaculate pieces. And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really mean much to me. I agree 100%. Yeah, there's a lot of junior level student portfolios that only have like the final character design. And that means absolutely nothing to me, right? Like that's not how it works in a game environment, right? You see iteration, you have, you know, sheets of variations and designs. And like, if I can see where you started and where you ended up, even if the ending design isn't great, maybe one of your iterations are, and then it's like, okay, why didn't this person pick this, right? Or like, what was their thought process? And hopefully they'll be, you know, part of the soft skills is them being able to speak articulately about their design process. And that's all concept art is. Like, we're the actual idea guys, like in a game studio. And so you need to be able to like, describe your ideas. And like we were mentioning earlier, like I, cannot recommend specializing to any hopeful concept artists like just doing characters or something if you're trying to break into the industry because odds are entry-level positions are going to be short-term contracts maybe junior positions but you're not going to be tasked doing characters unless they're like background npcs and even then there's like a finite end to the amount of npcs you can have in a game right and like your studio is not going to spend a lot of money on that so you want to have props in your portfolio (laughs) <laughs> I think one way to look, like you said earlier, where it's like you have one character and everything else is environment. Another way to look at that too is that one character 
oftentimes a company will bring in a specific person to work on that one character. Yeah. So it's not going to yeah. be an entry level job. It's going to be a position yeah. that's already taken and it's already been taken like a year ago. So And look at like, <laughs> for example, Horizon Zero Dawn, they hired Loish to design Alloy. And that's an external contractor. You know, I don't know if she worked on site or not, but that yeah, that job was taken. Right? What what I was going to say is actually something kind of similar because being in a position to hire concept artists right now, I know I understand what's valuable in terms of like an internal team versus what's valuable as like an external contractor. So the stuff you see on ArtStation, like the very pretty big paintings and very finished and rendered stuff is completely fine for like, you know, if you want to inspire the team, show them like a blue sky image and say, hey, this is what we can achieve. But what really matters to me in terms of game production is somebody who can draw really well, who can solve like visual problems on the fly. People who are good at like what I call like the napkin sketch, who could walk to an environment artist next to their desk, see an issue and like napkin sketch a solution and give it to them so that they can figure it out right um that is what's so much more valuable in terms of like actual game production because as an art director those are the people who i want on my team solving those problems so drawing skills are paramount i don't care if it's character or environment i've hired uh, artists that were that draw mostly characters but i see a good drawing fundamental so i think they can absolutely trans transition into props and, and vice versa um like that to me is what's always most important is drawing and design fundamental and good taste, obviously. Um, yeah. So when it comes to like, hey, well, we want to put this together in a painting for like a pitch so we can get more investor money. I'm like, I'll just hire somebody outside to do that. Like, that's so easy. <laughs> like I could just hire one of a hundred different uh, environment painters who make pretty images and they could do it. I just give them a flat rate and, and we're done but it's not going to solve any problems for production. It might inspire the team and that's huge. Right. But we need to also inform the team. So I, I for me, like informing the team is first for, with an internal artist and, and inspiring is second. So that's a, that's an interesting point. We've been talking about in-house and in-studio work, which being able to draw, being able to design very quickly and iterate is really important. I mean, uh, for me, like, you know, when we were working together, that was a lot of, like crates and whatnot and iterations and drawings, you know, mood paintings and whatever, and they're quick. But if you did want to work in games, there is basically a path for, to specialize and that would be a, kind of like an external contractor where like you are being hired to paint the pretty pictures and only that. Um, and for people who do want to specialize and go in that direction, would you say that skills like that like more pers uh, personalized like i only do literally i only do this would that be more valuable for them you know versus just the drawing because right nowadays we have a lot of external outsourcing studios and they're being used for very specific things so would you say that's a viable kind of like advice or slash path for you know so like future artists now so if somebody just wants to make pretty paintings then to stay home and be a contractor is that, is that <laughs> yeah like saying? one pixel brush. um yeah I, I, that is definitely an avenue i i don't want to say that it's the only avenue because a job of a concept artist is to both inform and inspire so i don't want to say that you have to be pigeonholed into one or the other um i think you'll be a better painter making beautiful marketing images if your drawing fundamental is good right <laughs> if your drawing fundamentals really good, it's going to make those even better. Like you see, you know, our artists like Eitan, Zana, like they use photos, they use 3D, but why is it that their compositions, their art looks so much better than other artists that, that use those same processes is because the drawing fundamental is there, like painting fundamental, color and light fundamental, right? Like, so I don't think it, ha you have to be one or the other, like you can, and each studio is different. So what, what I'm working on is like more of like a stylized fantasy game. So everything is about drawing fundamental because we have to design and stylize everything. We have to follow a style guide. Now, if we're doing like a realistic modern shooter game, <laughs> now maybe drawing fundamental isn't exactly the most important thing. Maybe using Quixel assets is, is the better skill, to be honest. Then perfect. Like that works, right? Um, it just depends on the project and the studio too. I think going off of that too, though, uh, you you can be like an external kind of freelance contract artist and you probably could 
kind of really push a specific look and vision. And if you're good enough, you'll start to get people coming to you for that work. That's, I, you can go that route. It's a possibility. It uh, kind of having just like tons of pretty pictures and being like, ah, come to me for this specific type of work. Mm -hmm. uh, it does seem like that's definitely a possibility because unique vision is something that's really important as well. But then that's, you know, it's not necessarily someone you're going to want to hire in-house, but like Jeremy's saying, like coming up with a really unique look to get someone excited about a game or a show, then yes, you'll, you're likely to get contacted. Yeah, and that's that's interesting when you look at artists like uh, Thomas Scholes or Nicholas Cole, who they do kind of have specialist roles that they are very, very good at. You know, Nick is amazing at stylized characters. Thomas is amazing at like these really ethereal like environments and compositions and houses and buildings. But um, both of them had a background working in-house first for years, big studios, and getting that experience and understanding how the pipeline works and how games work and how games are made. And then we're able to build up a following and build up reputation within the industry, right? You, numbers don't always mean anything on social media. And so they are so good at their craft and so good at this kind of like area of expertise that, you know, like Tim was saying, they have people uh, and lots of studios coming to them for specialist contract work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for portfolio stuff, I would say all three of you have definitely seen a lot of portfolios. Um, so what would be some advice you would give for, you know, like how many, yeah. what are the first things you should look at? Another sub question underneath that is also, you know, how do you tell somebody to highlight your, you know, strongest, like see what your yeah. strongest work is? I'll just say this right at the top. Don't build your own like flash websites <laughs> or your, I don't know what, just, just make an art station. I don't care how many followers you have. Just make an art station and submit that. It's, it's free. It's easy to look at. I don't have to click through five things to see your artwork, um, and 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 that that's a huge thing because I, I you know sometimes when I get portfolios I, I get like three seconds, <laughs> it's three seconds. If I don't see art and I'm still clicking, then it's a no, right? Like I, I just want to get to the art and see what's going on there. Um, yeah, make it very easy for people to look at your art and and, and look at it um, at a high quality. Uh, the other thing is I would rather quality over quantity any day. You know, you could have five great pieces and then like two or three that are not good. And I'm just going to remember those three that are not good. Um, there's many portfolios I look at. And when I think back to that person, I just think about their worst images and not their best images. So definitely make sure you're only presenting your best stuff. If you're like the person that likes doing characters and it's your best stuff and your environment work is really not good maybe I would just only share the character stuff <laughs> right? until you can get your environment work up to a same level of quality. Um, I, I, for one, just, you know, I think qual quality over quantity always, right? Um, that's just my two cents. Yeah, going off of that too is uh, if you have like a bunch of work and a bunch of characters and a bunch of environments and you like doing characters, you're probably going to get hired for environments. And then vice versa, if you like doing environments, you'll probably get called on for characters. So if, if you want to do a specific thing, show that in your portfolio. Don't show something you don't want to do yeah. unless, yeah. unless you're in like dire straits and you really need work. Uh, going off of what Jeremy said as well, though, the uh, uh, having a website that is easy to navigate and you're to the work immediately. If I have to like dig for the work at all, then it's like, why, why are you showing me this? Why, is, why did you choose this website? And I've yeah, said, don't, people have, don't send a Dropbox link where I have to ask for <laughs> access. Don't do that either. Yeah. And when applying to a job, I've literally, uh, maybe half of the applications I get, I have to dig for their link. And I'm like, why? And that's, that's an immediately, I'm just like, well, I've got all these others that the links right there and they, gave it to me directly and they gave me a portfolio and then all these other people didn't send it, which I don't know why people are sending me applications without portfolios, but make sure to remember that as well. Uh, going on to the whole website thing. I know there's like Wix websites out there and ArtStation and all that stuff. Just go with ArtStation. It's kind of like the industry standard. If you have a website that has like a bunch of stuff that says built by blah, 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 or it just is hard to navigate or the website that you're using gives you enough kind of, uh, challenge to build your own website so it's enough that it really makes your website look terrible like you need to know how to build a website don't use that platform you shouldn't be spending your time building a website so just art station uh, as 
I'm a little bit different as far as the amount of pieces. I do like seeing a bit more work as long as it's categorized. Like I want to see your kind of your standard portfolio. That's a few kind of distinct pieces. This is really what you focus on, but I like seeing the other stuff as well. Like other things you can work on and older work. I do like seeing that people have progressed over the years. I've seen some portfolios where they've included years of work and not the ideal portfolio, but personally, I enjoy looking through it and seeing how much an artist has changed. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for a uh, professional portfolio though, if you are looking for work. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of almost the opposite. Like I, I don't always want to jump immediately into an artist art station because depending on how long they've been in the industry or, you know, not long at all, there might not be that many pieces or there might be so many pieces. And I'm like, Oh my God, I don't want to dig through this. I don't have time for this. So I almost would really love to go to a personal website and you know, you can Google Callum Alexander Watts website. He does uh, games and film now and you click on his website, you click on his name and he just has all of his best work top to bottom stacked in the homepage. That's it. That's all I want to see. You know, Usually I say like 10 to 15 of your best work, just stack it on the homepage, name at the top, contact info. And so then all you have to do is scroll, 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 scroll. Great. I know exactly what you think your best work is, right? Oh, and then maybe at the bottom, maybe then there's an ArtStation link or a Tumblr link or like whatever. So then you can see all the dozens of other pieces you do. You know, I've, I've set my website up like that and it's worked for me so far, um, even if it is a little bit more work. But I also use like a pre-made portfolio building website for artists like I'm not gonna waste time doing stuff myself <laughs> <laughs> so presentation needs to be a plus your strongest work only special yeah. uh, share what you want to do and hope you show it well <laughs> now we're gonna switch gears a bit uh there's a lot of questions from the chat and so starting from you know the first top of the list about working from home um one are you guys hiring any interns during the pandemic <laughs> you know on <laughs> I, I hear some chuckles and then how is working from home changed working <laughs> how's that like changed the pipeline are you guys enjoying it uh, at system era we actually did just hire a little audio intern and she's doing great but she's on the east coast and has to like conform to our west coast times <laughs> yeah but uh we don't have any art intern and mostly that's just because we don't have the bandwidth for it, unfortunately. Like it actually costs the studio more money to hire an art intern because the artists who are already in house then have to take time away from working on the project to train and teach and talk. And that is too expensive for a lot of small teams, unfortunately. We're in the same yeah, boat. Good. Yeah. Like I wish we could. I, I, yeah. I've been a teacher for seven years. I like mentoring people and I want to have like a good internship program but maybe when we're like 300 <laughs> right now we're 30 yeah. or we're like 34 uh in our studio so we're very small and yeah the cost of having that is too great because it goes beyond monetary even if you're like i'll do it for free it still costs yeah. we still have to pay state dues and there's taxes and there's other legal things to get through to, in order to have it that um, makes it a bit complicated yeah, same here. We don't have one right now. We're we're about twenty five or so in our studio, and it's so small that you know, like everyone's saying, it takes so much energy just to get someone up to speed. And then, kind of uh, with an intern program, the the way it works, like you have they have to be there for something that you can teach them. It's not something that you really need. It's something that you already have within the studio. So it can't be you can't bring in people that like if you don't have a concept artist you can't bring in a concept artist that's uh an intern like that that doesn't that's not right <laughs> as far as like your second part of the question working from home i hate working from home like i really freaking hate it i actually i went full-time last year with a studio i was contracting with so i could be in-house in a studio setting among other artists and then like you know, of course, 2020 happened. And now I'm back to working from home and my brain keeps going, we're freelancing, right? And I'm like, no, we have healthcare. We're not freelancing. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of, I like it and I don't like it. I think I used, I'm used to it because I used to do freelance as well. So it kind of, when it was like, hey, we're going, we're going remote. 
a lot of people were filled with dread, but I was just kind of like, well, I guess it's just kind of like going back to like six or yeah. seven years ago and returning to my weird lifestyle where <laughs> <laughs> I don't leave my house anymore. But yeah, I, at the same time, like, I feel like um, I've been able to focus a bit more in some cases. I have a few less people kind of tapping me on the shoulder to be like, hey, can you check this out and this out? So it's it helps me manage my time a bit better. I've actually been able to get more concept art into the game. I've been able to finish things more. Uh, but at the same time, like I really miss my team and the studio and everything. Like we have a lot of great people to work with. So I, I miss that a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of the same. I'm a bit of an introvert. Right. Same. So I'm okay with uh, having some distance. <laughs> I do, you know, I, I would get tapped a lot in, for a lot of meetings or walk by people's desk and, and help people out constantly at work, which is great. I like that. I kind of miss it now, but right. it, you know, working from home, you do, you are able to kind of like incubate a little bit and focus on one thing at a time it, and set up your, your schedule in a, in a good way. And it, and for me, it's like being able to take a break from work, and then go for a walk with my dog and, and hang out with my wife and, and just be at home is really great. And then I can just hop back on the computer and now I'm back at work. I think that's something that is really amazing. At <laughs> the same time. At the same time. <laughs> yeah. I was going to yeah, say work-life separation. Is, yeah, you got to separate holy it. Holy shit, right. yeah. Oh, so, it's, uh, it's so hard. Like, yeah. I have my desk like right in my living room too. So it's even worse because it's just like I watch TV like right over there. So that's my casual spot. Yeah. And then over here, it's like the work spot. So it's I had like, to do a lot of like psychological stuff to kind of get that separated nicely. It's like 1030 and I see Slack message and I have to run back. What is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my desk is like at the foot of my bed. So I can like roll out of bed and into my desk chair and it's not healthy. That's <laughs> not good. So one thing that I started doing is I have, um, I, I bought a separate pair of shoes that are my indoor shoes. And when I go to work, I put on my shoes, just because it's like I would if I was in the office. And then when I'm done with work, I take the shoes off. Your work shoes. I like it. My work shoes. <laughs> that, that doesn't work for a person like me who doesn't even wear their shoes at work. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> I remember, I remember those bare feet. Work socks? No, not even socks, though. No. No. I used to go she barefoot put a lot, bare never, feet like never on, in office. on top of the desk. We're like, oh, <laughs> I did not know that. That's, that's spreading. No, that's no, slander. No. That's slander. slander. Sorry, you were like, <laughs> your feet, slander. actually, your whole body was just on the chair. You were like curled up into it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in general, uh, working from home really hasn't, uh, it's just a mental shift. Uh, yeah. For communication, been, everyone seems to be like, oh, this is, it, it, yeah, they've adjusted. I it's think, a lot more meeting, so. <laughs> oh. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And then for me, it's a lot of, uh, like, I'm, I'm worried about the, the rest of my team, too, a lot more, because every day I, before I could see them in person, make sure everyone's cool. But now it's like everyone's locked up in their house. And that's, that could be a little bit concerning, right? That's so it has people to hang out with. So try to make sure that the, there's social interaction for everybody and everyone's yeah. happy and doing well. Like the logistical end of it for us, moving our team remote was not bad because we, like, we yeah. have Perforce, it's on the cloud, like we can whitelist, you know, it's not like technically it's fine. It's more the cultural end of things, making sure yeah. that like everyone feels like they're still part of the team, that we still have good line of communication. That has been the trickier part that we're trying to figure out. Um, and it's new for us. So, yeah, we keep like exploring different things, like trying different things to get better interaction and be like, do this work better? Does this work better? And just keep pushing on things and yeah, make sure nothing, it evolves. There's nothing better than forced social hour. There are some questions about kind of the future of gaming, new tech programs. What are you excited about? And, you know, do artists need to learn AR, VR tech? you know as you guys have mentioned also even like programming or coding and then there's another kind of question along the lines of that which is you know is the gaming industry actively changing to be more inclusive um and is it getting more friendlier for female slash non-binary artists and i know those are two separate questions that's a lot of questions yeah those are very <laughs> very separate yeah. questions. but uh so I'll... future of gaming and tech okay i, I got some answers then... for the tech one <laughs> to start off i was gonna say uh for me as far as like concept artists is concerned like 
use every tool you can get. Like uh, look at Blender. Blender is a fantastic tool for Blender. modeling and sculpting, drawing and everything. And uh, kind of even going back a few years, 3D wasn't really part of a concept artist uh, tool set. And I started using that. I used to hide it a little bit. And then after a while, I was like, oh, it's kind of standard now. So it's okay. Uh, but yeah, use every tool you can get. For me, I, I'll use like VR sculpting. I'll take that sculpt and then throw it in something else, paint over it, and then like throw in another program. I'll use like 10 programs on one piece if it helps the process and speed it up and gives me new ideas, which sculpting and like VR and stuff, that's like completely free form. You can come up with a lot of new kind of shapes and forms and kind of break yourself out of a maybe a thinking pattern you might have been in. So I love new tools. I use new tools as much as I can. Yeah, I would say like pick up new software as you need it. If you're like learning 3D would really help me with this piece. That's a great motivation. As far as knowing like VR tech or coding, I'd say only if you want to. If that's what interests you, broaden your T skills, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that really helps. I mean, if you're a, code, a really good concept artist who's got like great drawing fundamental, painting fundamental, and you can transition that into something like 3D, or you can have a, an eye for composition, but understand the process of using Blender or using 3D tools. It's just going to make your 3D work that much better. It's just, it's going to make you stand out even more. I would not approach 3D or other tools because you feel you have to, because other people are doing it. I think what you could do is just always explore new tools and try to learn them and then try to find ways that you can bring that back to your core and not have to like be a different artist all of a sudden because you're using a different tool. The tool should only just kind of help complement your existing core, your existing art skill and not sidetrack you. So don't think because, oh, I'm, I'm using 3D now, I have to make this kind of art. No, make your kind of art, make what you do what you do and see how you can use 3D to augment or, or help. Uh, your your current process going off that too is the more you kind of get into 2d and 3d the less there is a division between the two and the more you'll just kind of see them as sort of just different sides of the same equation or whatever it's like it you'll eventually just start doing 2d stuff that looks very 3d and they, they, they'll both help each other it seems like if you more work on 3d the more you kind of understand form shape and the more you work on 2d the more you understand that as well and it kind of builds back and yeah, forth so Using ZBrush has helped me with drawing, just yeah, like exactly. drawing fundamental and like form language uh, in, a, in a huge way. Because I, when I draw, I can think about how it would be sculpted or how it would be built in 3D. It actually helps the design process. If a concept artist, if you're unsure that you're kind of doing your job, if you can take your concept art and try to model that, that's a very good test. If you go to model a concept you did and you're unable to do that, there's probably a problem with your concept or something that uh, isn't maybe reading correctly. So doing that as a test is a really great thing too, I think. Mm -hmm. to, to broach the, the inclusivity topic question, I think that as far as like, are things changing to be more inclusive? I think more people are paying attention now. Um, I think it's on more people's radars than it was before. And I also think that as far as being more friendly for like women and the and kind of marginalized genders, um, it depends on the studio and it depends on the team culture. And I know it's really hard when you're trying to get a job. You maybe have one interview out of hundreds of applications and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is like, I really, really want this. But when you're in an interview setting, you are interviewing the studio just as much as they are interviewing you, right? And you want to actively have questions, you know, oh, do you know the percentage of women and marginalized genders in your studio, right? Do they have that information? Are they paying attention to that, right? How many people interviewing you are, you know, women or non-binary folks, right? How many are, uh, you know, members of marginalized races as well? Like, what is the makeup of the studio? And you need to make that decision yourself. And you need to take the impetus to ask them questions to figure out if that studio is going to be a good fit for you and your values. And if your values align with the studio's values. Sometimes they don't. And sometimes you just need a job. And if that's the case, you need to find a good support network of folks outside of the studio who are in the industry who can empathize and kind of hold each other's hands through rough times. Um, that's what's gotten me through a lot of crap. And then maybe you get that job. It's not a good culture fit and you just actively keep interviewing and applying, right? It's always easier to get the next job once you have a resume that looks good. Like Ness said, it does seem like there is more awareness of it and it is slowly changing, but it's it's so deeply rooted that it 
I think a lot of people don't even see it. There'll be studios that their entire studio is all men or all white men. So they have one perspective or very limited perspective. So they're, even if they're looking for people, they're already pretty biased in their search. And I, I feel this too, like when I'm, I'm an art director and I probably have a bias as well, but I try to make sure to see my bias and make sure to like combat against it too. So it's not something that's just about awareness and people are just like, oh, we got to start doing this. It's, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of like self-reflection, I think too, and studio self-reflection and understanding the culture that you have in a studio, what you're trying to build, what you want to build. And it's, it's very difficult, but I, it's something that we have to have to push because not only is it getting diversity in studios, like that diversity in a studio the projects they work on will then have that diversity built into them and will stop have, stop seeing like just stupid mistakes in games or it's like obviously someone wasn't thinking because they didn't have that diversity in their studio. They had one single perspective. So I think for me, a lot of it isn't just about even diversity in a studio. It's about that diversity it ends up making a better project too. It's It helps yeah. everybody. And then that trickles down to people playing those games and seeing that representation. That's so important. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, that's definitely something we have part of our values is that we want the the audience that we want to attract should also reflect the developers that are happening internally. So if we want 50-50 male, female, um, and we want a diverse set of people playing our game and expressing themselves in our game, then we need to, we need to have that in-house too. We need to make sure that we're we're hiring in a way that's that's very diverse and and that we're getting people from different backgrounds like even just within the art team i don't want to hire people who are just like me i don't want to <laughs> hire people who think exactly like i do i want people that that come from and, and approach problems from a very different perspective because that's going to make our visual designs richer it's going to make our art richer it's going to make our game project richer in the end um, and it and it isn't even just some like I, I don't know, just this isn't this isn't just coming out of nowhere too. There's been a lot of studies that show that like companies that are more diverse, companies that have diversity and higher um, in leadership tend to have more success, most monetarily and in, in reaching out and finding audiences. Like there's a study after study that's being done of this that actually proves this. And I see it like, you know, having like with me, the, the artists that I work with are where we work with contractors all around the world. And when I was starting out, I was it was really important for me that I make sure that I get I work with this artist in China, I work with this artist in Ukraine, Australia, Sweden. I like to have people from very different backgrounds contributing to the concept art and contributing to add like more spice to our our soup that is the game. So for me, I think it's like absolutely crucial for the type of game I'm making and and our goals that we have the most diverse uh, people contributing to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The next batch of questions we have about, you know, portfolio and skill building. Should you do a specific style in your portfolio or is it better to have a variety of styles? Uh, there's another question which I feel is related. If you have a portfolio that's geared towards games, would you also be equally considered for animation um, or mobile? as well or if you're mobile going to triple a like everyone has said about you know fundamentals is important but now what about style i can talk a little bit about the uh mobile question because that's kind of how i started i started a mobile studio and then kind of basically just phased out that area uh it's almost more of a style thing in a lot of cases with mobile because mobile is a lot about understanding uh performance issues and things where, like that like it comes down a lot to making your shape language a little bit chunkier so you have less of uh, dense models and things like that. So I think mobile concept art versus regular like AAA concept art, there's not too much of a difference really there. It's more about what's appropriate for like the system that you're going to be putting your game on. Yeah, I think as far as like the style question goes, um, depends on where you want to be hired. When I was trying to make my portfolio to get into the industry where it was like, oh, if you're playing to Blizzard, they want to see blizzard reflected in your portfolio and they don't want any pieces that doesn't look like blizzard right um and the people you're competing with to get you know a job at blizzard all their stuff looks just like blizzard right so they you know there's some studios who like they don't want to teach you how to paint in their house style you need to be able to chameleon to that house style so that you can fit into the pipeline and that they don't waste money training you up right well, i come from a comic book like stylized background and so all the projects I've worked on are heavily stylized games. And 
they don't all look the same, but if you can have a portfolio that establishes, oh, I understand the foundations, you know, I know anatomy, therefore I can style, stylize anatomy this way or this way or that way, that's super valuable. And then if you want to go a more realistic AAA route, you know, have the stuff in your portfolio, you understand photo bashing, you understand how to integrate 3D, you know, you want to kind of match the look of the studios you want to get into. Uh, some something I like to talk people through is like, okay, so what's your dream studio? Great. That's your like five to 10 year plan. What are the studios you need to be at to then get to that goal? Right. So, and then work backwards basically, and then figure out, it's kind of like a math equation, figure out, okay, what does my portfolio need to look like to get to this place that I can then get to this place that I can then, you know, get to where I want to be. Um, and that's also kind of helps you realistically look at that and examine your growth and like what you need to add to your portfolio in that way. So yeah, I think look at the types of studios you want to work at. And then I say this jokingly, internet stalk the artists who work at those studios and figure out their portfolios. <laughs> because I bet you once they get hired at that studio, they've not updated their portfolio. So the portfolio you can find online is the portfolio they were hired for. And so see what their stuff looks for. And that's what that studio would be looking for. And yeah. I, I'll i say personally, I never considered style like really ever. Uh, I never really <laughs> thought about it. I just do what I do. And all my little imperfections and what I do in my process is kind of my style, I guess. But as, you know, looking for artists that to work in a very particular style. It is very particular, you know. There are certain things that I am looking for, a certain like style range that I'm looking for in a, in a concept artist. So what I care most about, not only with the concept artists, but with 3D artists, with animators, is style flexibility. So there's some uh, some candidates, like 3D candidates that I, that I like that maybe have come from working at Treyarch. But you see in their in their personal portfolio that they do like doing stylized work and they have the capability to do that. They understand, they have good taste in like 2D design, they have good taste in, in like stylized work. If I see that in there, that's actually huge because th this is an artist that can hit the quality level that is expected from a AAA, but it's also understands like, has good taste in stylized work, has good understanding in shape language and stuff like that. So having just a core understanding of shape language is to me more important and having the ability to flex. Now, that's because I don't, you know, my studio, we're not Blizzard. We not, you know, no, not everybody knows the name of the studio and not everybody understands our style, at least not yet. Um, but <laughs> uh, but at, when I look at portfolios, I'm like, yeah, you clearly want to work at Riot. Yeah, you clearly want to work at Blizzard. And it's a bit of a, it's a little bit of a turnoff for me when I'm looking for artists. Like, it's a bit of like, well, they just want to go there. They don't, they don't seem very flexible in this, right? So I think it's okay to like have some, have some pieces that are geared towards Blizzard, but know that Blizzard is not the only opportunity out there and they have limited seats, right? They, they, they only hire so many people at a time. And there could be other studios like mine who might be looking for somebody like yourself um, that if you just showed a little bit more flexibility in, in what you do, it could open up other unforeseen opportunities that are greater, you know, because when you're starting out and you're thinking of the studios, you just think of like five major studios, but there are a lot of other studios out there who are looking for talent and you might be surprised at what you find yourself in. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. TLDR, if you want to pursue a house style, right, go a hundred percent, but realize that there are other people who are yeah. trying to do the same thing. However, yeah having a range of styles or showing that you can do it is also valuable if you were the type of artist that wanted to do that yeah you could right. be like so dead focused on on blizzard 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 but then miss out on all this other stuff that's yeah. happening yep yeah i kind of like seeing it from approach where it's you'll have like kind of the work that you really like to do and then maybe you have a piece or two where you show that like hey i took this character or this environment here's it in like three different styles and then I'm like, oh, look, that's a great range. That's awesome. That's like a huge benefit. That's mm -hmm. that's great when I see that. That's I would never be like, oh, why did they do multiple styles? So, <laughs> uh, but then that being said too, it's like if I see a portfolio that's just all Blizzard stuff, I'm like, I don't think they'd be happy working here. Why would why would they even want to apply here? If all their work mm -hmm. looks specifically like this. It's almost like they're coming to me to kind of like, you know, until they can finally get to Blizzard. Yeah, yeah, you feel like a stepping yeah. stone at that point. It's like, yeah, you're probably not going to get hired because it's pretty clear what you want. 
<laughs> um, and that actually, that's like going into another good question, which is, you know, what practices do you guys incorporate into your art training routine? You know, like plain airs, um, an inspiration from life. I know Jeremy and Tim are both plain air painters. Ness, you've definitely done some. <laughs> um, right. So like, right, as you're trying to create concept art for games, especially games having, you know, house styles and whatnot, um, you know, what practices do you guys do to enrich your concept thing uh a whole bunch of different things um the things that i used to do a lot is i would just go on map crunch you know the random street view and just like you know click on some cities and just do like a random shot and just do a painting of it that's really great like it just kind of helps with your perceptual skills kind of helps you like with your efficiency and building up a scene that's very complicated in a very like fast and efficient way um i used to do it every morning for a long time i would just always that. do that mm -hmm. um i would do a lot of like noton studies or just you just focus on black and white can i paint this big complicated scene but simplify it in just two values black and white that's a really big thing that I, I think has helped me a ton. Um, and there was another thing that I would do a lot, which was I would take like a, a scene in a movie, like a, like a movie that I really like, and, and watch the scene, right? And just see how the characters interact, kind of get a sense of the setting. And I would make an original like screenshot or original painting that doesn't exist in the movie, but that also tells the story. So that's a really good way of like helping you explore um, like, because when you're looking at the movie, you're pointing out all the different assets that are in the scene, and then you can reconstruct it into an original composition and push the style, and then you have an understanding of the story because you watch the scene play out. So then you can you can also work on your storytelling and illustration skills. So that's a that's a study that I would do occasionally. It's it's really fun, actually. I do film studies and stuff once in a while. Uh, I always try to remember to start when I'm drawing, like I'll be a little bit rusty and just like draw a shape and like spin it across the page or something. Cause just to get my mind warmed up, if I don't do that, it's like super frustrating. I'm like, ah, oh, I can't draw anymore or whatever. So I'll do stuff like that. Um, do a lot of thumbnail explorations, gonna really explore composition, things like that. Less studying lately just because I've been so busy with work, though, but uh, used to do more of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sad. Yeah, I, I relate to that pretty hard. I've been in and out of burnout for the last few years. And so studying to me seems like, oh, my God, like, you know, which you, you get into drawing and it's like a happy place. But I feel like sometimes forcing yourself to do it is hard yeah. after you've done it for eight hours. Um, so something I like doing that I've kind of recontextualized as studying is I realized that your visual library in your brain is just as important as like muscle memory and like knowing how to draw stuff. So the way I visualize it is as like a sponge or a bucket where it's like, okay, in order for me to sit down for eight plus hours a day and like produce good, clean, informative work is I need to be drawing upon a visual library of shots and colors and design and stuff that I've stored up in my brain by looking at other art forms and looking at other work. So I, for myself, contextualize, you know, just looking at other artists' portfolios, watching movies, looking through art books, playing video games, all that stuff is not only a tax write-off, but is also super important for me to build up the visual library in my brain and kind of raise those levels and be like, oh, wow, look at this like robot. That's a really cool leg design. Let me zoom into that. Let me try to, you know, recreate it on my own. Get to that Kim Jong-ji goal, right? Of just having this insane visual library in your brain you can whip out. You know, not saying reference is bad, but it also kind of when I experience other like entertainment mediums, it makes me excited to draw again and be like, oh yeah, like this is why I got into it. This is what I love doing. And so I'm trying to circumnavigate burnout in that way. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a lot of studying in various forms, <laughs> not just one. Yeah. It's film, life, drawing, slash painting, slash... Uh... Yeah, I, I think like it's important to use reference as much as possible. But I think when you do a study, you have, to have, you have to have an actual goal for it. It cannot be like, I'm just copying this image because you're not going to learn as much. It's like, can I reproduce this image only using the shape tool or only the lasso tool? Or can I like 
do it in heavy paint or something like that, right? Um, I think there should always be an end goal and not just copying for the sake of copying. I think on top of that too, there's uh, you can get in this sort of pattern where you're like, oh, it's all about mileage. So I need like just tons and tons of mileage. But if you're doing that, sometimes your brain kind of goes on autopilot. You have to make sure when you're doing that mileage stuff that your brain has switched over into like the learning side of things. I, I found myself where I'm just like kind of just droning on like a zombie drawing stuff. And I realize, oh, I'm not actually like computing or thinking about this while I'm drawing. I'm not breaking it down and really thinking about the pieces that make this up. So be careful when you are doing like the mileage thing that you're really, really studying and you're not just sort of just like what Jeremy was saying, you're not just replicating what you see, but you're actually trying to break it down and look at it from different perspectives, like turn around in your mind and things like that. A good experiment that I do a lot is I'll look at reference, draw what I see, but I'll draw it at a different position or something. I'll spin it upside down or look at it from behind, but I'm only looking at the reference from the one view. So it's right. taking my mind and I'm really, really calculating and thinking about how I'm breaking this down and not just, oh, I'm just getting my, getting my mileage down. Because I, I felt like I wasted a lot of time just thinking. I was like, oh, people are like, oh, got to get those 10,000 hours. So I really pushed mileage. But really, I should have been just like really thinking about what I was doing and thinking about the choices I'm making. How am I breaking this down? How can I simplify it so that my mind can remember it? So that's mm-hmm. a, I think that's a good thing to remember. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the end of our session. Thanks Yay. for having us. Thanks for listening. We love hearing from you. Feel free to write us a review on Apple Podcasts or other platforms. Leave us a comment on YouTube or just message us on Instagram. If you want to support us, please consider donating on Gumroad. You'll find a link in the description. All right, see you again soon.